welcome everyone this morning here in the name of the Lord. Today we'll hear that wonderful parable that Jesus will tell about the parable of the wedding feast. And he sends out all of these invitations. And it's incredible because it fits so well with, with our Bible study that we're looking at with this whole wokeism in America today too. That here God is inviting everybody to the free gift of eternal life and this wedding feast that will never end. But yet so many people think he's oppressive and they'll actually reject it and actually kill God's messengers. Whether that's the pastors, you as a Christian, or even the church. But yet what stands behind it is just the king who's willing to literally give you his own righteousness and the shirt off his back and give up his son for you. But yet so many people reject this good and gracious gift. But today, that call goes out for us to hear, to listen to, and then to believe and to accept that invitation to this great feast that God has for us. Here are the foretaste of the feast to come at church, Sunday after Sunday, and also the eternal feast of heaven. And, and that will be the focus then of our worship service then here this day. So we begin our worship then as we sing our opening hymn. Talks about that gracious invitation. That God has for us as we sing Him 915. Today your mercy calls us.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Allah, by the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. I invite the congregation then to please kneel as we confess our sins. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon then this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And instead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I invite the congregation then to please stand, enter forgiven, in the presence of the Holy God, with the words of our intro here this morning. We'll read portions of Psalm or Isaiah 61. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels.
Almighty God, you invite us to trust in you for our salvation. Deal with us, not in the severity of your judgment, but by the greatness of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Be suited for our readings. The Old Testament reading then for this 20th Sunday after Pentecost is taken from the prophet Isaiah, 25th chapter. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well aged wine, of rich food full of merit, of aged wine well refined. He will swallow up on this mountain, the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in His salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. God. The epistle then is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, the fourth chapter. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you have no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. By the congregation, then to please stand as we sing the hallelujah. St. Matthew writes, Again Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find, and those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. 
But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. We confess then the Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things are made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. May I be seated then as we sing the hymn of the day, 515, Rejoice, Rejoice, Believe.
and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The king prepared a great feast, unlike anything anyone had ever seen before. The oxen and the fattened calf were slaughtered and prepared. He rolled out the best wine that had ever been seen. Nothing but the best would be enough for this feast that he prepared for his son and his son's bride on their wedding. He wished to honor them on their glorious day. And not only this, but he wanted his people to be part of it as well. He loved his son and he loved his people and wanted them all to share in this glorious communion. Everything for this feast was prepared, and the king sent out his messengers to call all the people to the feast. Everything was prepared, but none of the people that were invited cared. He called his guests to the feast, but they refused to come. And we might ask ourselves, why did they refuse to come? Wouldn't they be clamoring for an opportunity to be with their king, to sit at his table? Some of the people that were invited simply said that they were too busy to come to the feast, and one went away to his farm, and the other one to his business. Some showed their open and outright hatred for the king, killing the messengers and persecuting them. The king wanted to share the joys of the wedding with his people and have them around his table. But their refusal sent the message to him loud and clear, we don't care about you. We don't care about your feast or your son or his bride. The king wanted to treat them like family, but they refused to be part of his family. Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is like this king who prepared a feast. And in the same way, our God, Heavenly Father, prepares a bride for His Son, His Holy Christian Church, and presents her to Jesus without spot or blemish. The Lord God, Heavenly Father, prepares a feast and invites you, not just as some afterthought invite on the tenth page of the guest list, but invites you as the very bride of Christ herself. Each and every Christian is part of the Bride of Christ, the Holy Christian Church, and each are invited to be part of the wedding feast. The Lord God, Heavenly Father, offers this feast, the marriage feast of the Lamb in His kingdom, which has no end. He washes the Bride of Christ from her sin and makes her new. He prepares a feast for her of His very Word, and Jesus gives His own body and blood for her to eat and to drink. Jesus gives his bride everything needed, both in this world and in the world to come. Everything is prepared. Everything in Christ is accomplished. But in the same way, so many who are invited simply don't care. We might ask, why would anyone refuse when such a great feast is placed before them? If they're offered so much, how could they possibly say no? But we see Jesus' words play out all throughout the scriptures, and we see it with our own eyes each and every day. Here before you today, God's word is being read in your hearing. God prepares his table before your very eyes, and yet there are billions of people in this world who will refuse to receive this gift today. There are thousands of people outside of the doors of this very church who will refuse to receive those gifts. And you also, even as the Bride of Christ, know that when you examine your own hearts, know that there have been times when you have been reluctant or even outright refused to receive those gifts as well. Some people will reject the gospel with outright hostility, like some of the people did in the parable. Some will despise the messengers, even persecute and kill them. And these people who are in outright rebellion to God have been tricked by Satan to believe that evil is good and good is evil. 
They've been caught up in this rebellion against God and refuse to see Him as the giver of all good things. Their own hardness of heart causes them to refuse to see their sin and need of salvation. And unless they repent of this wickedness and turn to Christ, they will perish in that wickedness. Like in the parable, when the king sends his soldiers to destroy the rebellious town, the day will come when God will destroy all evildoers, all unbelievers. And he is just in doing so. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, understand the gravity of the wrath of God that awaits all unbelievers. And with humility, remember that this is your fate outside of Christ as well. Repent daily of your own sins and turn to Christ again and again, lest you likewise perish. But also remember that those who are currently outside of Christ can be saved if they repent and turn to Christ. Therefore, we as the bride of Christ have the duty to continually invite those who are outside of the Christian faith to the marriage feast of the Lamb. It's not up to us to choose whether or not we do this. We can't refuse to just because we think they'll reject the message or because we know they'll persecute us, but rather it is our duty to constantly give that message to those who do not know Christ. There are others who will reject the gospel, but they try to be a little bit tactful or nicer in their refusal than the people who outright refuse and kill the messengers. They don't kill, they're not hostile, but, like in the parable, they simply say they're too busy to come to the marriage feast of the Lamb. The men in the parable thought that they had a valid excuse. I have my farm. I have my business. How could I possibly come to the feast? But in the end, they were really sending the same message back to the king as the ones who killed the messengers. They still said, I don't care about you. I don't care about your feast or your son or his bride. And for that reason, they too are caught up in the destruction of the town. They too perish along with the unrighteous unbelievers. And today there will still be people who will reject the gospel because they consider themselves to be too busy to hear it. My mind is too crowded with work, family, ma family matters, entertainment, and anything else to think about God. How am I supposed to consider my sin and my need for a Savior when I don't have time in the day to think about anything at all? Therefore, religion, anything spiritual, the big questions of life like, who am I? Where am I going when I die? Is there a God? Are all put on the back burner. Things that I can just shove off and think about when I want to, when I have time, or when these matters seem more important to me. But dear friends in Christ Jesus, this mentality is just as self-centered, just as rebellious as the person who outright kills the prophets. And even Christians suffer from the temptations to let the things of this world distract them from the things of God. Perhaps this is manifest when people will sometimes miss church for work or for youth sports or something like that. I know personally that I've had days where I think I'm too busy, I'm just keep going, I just keep going from one thing to the next, and then, what's the first thing that goes on those days? Prayer, personal devotions, because I tell myself that I simply don't have time for these things. I've had days where I know I should read the scriptures, but it just seems in that moment to be too much effort to pick up my Bible, open it up, and read it. I've had times where I'm sitting in the pew trying to listen to the scriptures being read or the sermon being preached, and my mind is bombarded with a million different things that cause my attention to be pulled in different directions. Dear friends in Christ, we all struggle with these issues. And it doesn't mean if you struggle with these things that you're not a Christian or that you're any less than a Christian of uh, any less of a Christian than anyone else. These are all things that we struggle with. But just because we all struggle with these things doesn't mean that this is an issue we can just ignore or shove under the rug. 
but rather because we all struggle with them, it's something we have to address all the more, something we have to take head on. It is a battle against our sinful flesh and against the devil to value the things of Christ for what they truly are. And on the contrary, it is so easy to think that the things of this world are more important than they really are. In the midst of this battle that you wage day after day, remember what your Lord offers you. Remember the feast that he sets before you. The God of all creation speaks to you directly in his word. He offers you the free forgiveness of your sins through the shedding of his blood. He gives you his body and blood to eat and to drink for your nourishment and for the forgiveness of your sins. He offers you eternal life with him in his kingdom. Dear Bride of Christ, nothing in this world compares to the riches that God offers you. Nothing that you can do in this life, own in this life, consume in this life, compares to the feast that our God offers you. Our God, the King, loves you. He prepares you as Christ's bride, the church. He calls you out of sin, invites you to the wedding feast, and wants to be with you forever. Come and receive the gifts of forgiveness, life, and salvation that Christ offers you. Come and taste the goodness of the Lord in his holy supper. Come and hear when he calls you in his word. Everything is prepared. All has been accomplished in Christ. Come to the feast. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite the congregation to please stand as the offering is brought forward and as we sing the offertory printed in your bulletin. Charlie, 
Harold, Torin, Vicki, and Donnie. We pray, Lord, that you would be with them in their time of suffering and their sorrow, as we pray for all who weep here, that at the last day they may be comforted, restored, and received into that eternal banquet of heaven. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly King, prepare a table before us in the midst of those who refuse your heavenly invitation. Keep your church unstained by the world that we might partake of your supper, worthily, clothed in our baptismal grace. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly King, give us such a joy in pursuing what is true, just, pure, and worthy of praise that spurning the temptations of this world, we would suffer no anxiety. Let our trust be placed fully in Christ, and let our hope rest in the life of the world that is to come. In the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I'd like the congregation then to please stand as we continue with the service of the sacrament, beginning there with the preface on the top of page 194. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is the right It's truly good right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. For Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. And His mercy endureth forever. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Bless we the Lord. bless you and keep you or make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God, that invitation goes out Sunday after Sunday, day after day. God calls us now to spend not only just this time with Him, but every day with Him, and eternity with Him. But it is amazing, as we were talking about in our Bible study here today, and kind of Sue Ross brought it out, it's always Satan's opportunity, though, to act like the Lord is some sort of oppressor that's out there. And, and, and He's not, but it, it seems that way to most people. But instead, He just wants to give you everything including his very own righteousness, which is the ticket that gets you into the banquet, because he even gives you the clothes to wear, as we heard Jesus tell in the parable today. He gives you his very own righteousness, takes away your unrighteousness, covers you with his righteousness. We had so many people say, don't want it. And, it. and it's just an amazing thing, but we have the opportunity to hear that call. God gives us the grace to receive that invitation and to be here to, to experience God's great love and mercy. A couple quick announcements, just a reminder, a fall break here for the Plymouth School Corporation and for our preschool. Uh, Sonia's down with her grandkids and family down in Indianapolis, so the church office closed uh, Monday and Tuesday. Uh, she'll be back and it'll be back open here on Wednesday. Wednesday night choir continues 7 o'clock of practice. Thursday we continue our study of, of Joseph and, and that incredible life of Joseph and how that connects to our lives. That's at 9 in the morning. Women's Guild has their work day details in the bulletin. Uh, it's at 7 o'clock on Thursday. And then next Sunday, we'll have our quarterly voters meeting. That's the deal with election of officers, uh, the budget for the year, all those reports. Uh, that packet is out there. Sonia got that already. That's out there uh, in the narthex. So pick that up so you have some time to look at all that because remember, we're trying to streamline our voters' meetings. So we're not going to have every board give a report unless there's something specific that needs to be brought up. So look at all that and we'll just have one motion to accept all the board reports. But that means you kind of spend that time this week looking at all that and getting ready for that. We won't have our annual harvest dinner. So that's been postponed. Because uh, if, if you looked at the gym, it's all tore up. They've got all the drywall now. They finished up late yesterday afternoon. Everything in there is done, so they're going to start all that finish work and all that taping and putting the mud up and everything. And we're hoping by the end of the month. Sean, did they give you any details? Hopefully by the end of the month, done with the painters and yes, everything? I would assume between two and three weeks. And we'll okay. Done, finished, painted, ready to go. So, yeah. So everything on the walls will be done. Then the next stage will be the refinishing of the floor down the road and then getting kind of a new sound system in there. But it already brightens it up already, just with the drywall. We'll be getting some new backboards in there, so if you want to go hang on the breakaway rim sometime, you can go in there and do that. So that'll be the, that'll be the next phase. That, uh, we'll get a trampoline for you to use, too, to be able to go up there and hang on the rim. But that'll, that'll, that'll be the next phase here coming up. So we'll meet here. Can't meet in the gym. The ABC room's too crowded, so we'll meet in the sanctuary here. Uh, next Sunday for voters meeting. Then other uh, announcements here today. Two weeks from today is Reformation Sunday. We will we will start a new class. We'll finish up our book Bible study next week. We'll be looking at the Catechism, which is really nothing more than taking a look at the issues of the day in light of God's Word. So we'll start that study 
uh, Martin Luther Small Catechism here in two weeks, and we're going to coincide that with our new member class. There's no reason for me to kind of teach it on Sunday morning and then Thursday night to teach the same thing. Plus, uh, it'll, it'll bring that uh, new member group in with the rest of the congregation, and uh, we'll get a chance to meet them. They can meet us. And we're going to do that together starting uh, Sunday, October 29th. So if you're interested in joining the church, that class will start then. And there's a sign-up sheet out there on the bulletin board. So you can kind of keep tabs on who's going to be doing that. Then also, hard to believe, but the children's Christmas program, just a couple of months away. Uh, coming up here on Sunday, December 17th at 9 o'clock. That'll be the church Christmas program. And the preschool program will be that same Sunday at 1045. So if you're interested in having your child or your grandchild be a part of that, let me know, let Sonia know, because we're putting the program together, and that way we can kind of construct it to fit who's going to be there and how many kids and so forth, because we'll be starting practice here in a couple of weeks as we move into next month. And then finally, the uh, giving tree. Uh, just a reminder, the details are there in the bulletin, but uh, going to help support our seminarian fund. We're very blessed every year. Chris is our eighth seminarian, but it's, it's that wonderful opportunity to yes, give them some practice and continue to work on their skills. But the congregation has seen this over the eight years that we've been doing this as an opportunity to impact the church at large. So it's kind of one of our missions because those guys every year are sent out to their own congregation. We have a way to kind of give them some, some practice time to keep honing their skills to impact Christ church at large. So always a reminder that we're, we're, we're always doing that, but it's not a part of our general fund. We do that with a separate fund. So the giving tree this month helps to support that program. And it's not like there's a dire need right now that we don't have anything in there. We won't be able to pay them or anything, but... We, we have that going into next year, but that will be something as the year goes on that will need some more funds to make that work. So the Giving Tree this month goes to support that. You can pick up envelopes if you'd like to do that on the, on the table over there by the uh, Giving Tree. So have a good week here in our Lord's name. Uh, people kind of ask, I'll just give you a quick update here on my health. People have kind of asked, they did go to the cardiologist. Uh, Friday, that, that all came back from what we know. They had given me the final report. But they said, if there's any issues, we wouldn't allow you to leave the building. So everything's cool. We'll contact you next week. So we'll, we'll wait for that. And I, I have some more tests from a nerve standpoint uh, coming up here tomorrow. But uh, it's kind of very interesting. I've been feeling a lot better the last four days. Something, it's like Wednesday after lunch, it's almost like a light switch was kind of flipped. And uh, every day we're kind of getting better. And so we give kind of thanks to God for that. I appreciate all the prayers and uh, everything else. So have, have a very good week. Uh, here is kind of fall break for a lot of people with their kids. Have a good week here in the name of the Lord. And we'll look forward to seeing you here sometimes throughout the week. And then also here next Sunday. So we'll wrap up our worship then today with a closing hymn in 818.